number of the Manchester State in this public debate this year. Um, so the topic of the debate today is this house would not wear the popping. Um, so before I start with the boring stuff, I'm going to introduce our speakers and kind of a big round of applause for who they are. Not just uh, <laughs> very keen though, very keen. Um, so on side proposition, speaking first, we have Maddie Fry, who's a freelance writer, journalist and author. We also have Chris Nyman, who's the co-founder and a national officer for the Stop the War Coalition. On the side opposition, we have Dr. Lynette Neufbacher, um, a former doubles advocate for the British Joint Intelligence Committee and a former senior lecturer in war studies at Sanford's Military Academy. Academy. And joining her, we have our very own Conor Ardell, who's the externals officer for Manchester Trade Union and is a second year PP student. So, big round of applause for Firstly, I'd like to talk about how I believe the original reasons behind Remembrance Day are gradually being eroded by their association with modern wars. Secondly, I wish to talk about how I believe being a soldier is not something heroic in itself. And thirdly, how we are straying dangerously close to using Remembrance Day as a means for promoting the idea of the absolute value of war and why this sets a dangerous procedure. <coughs> but first off, I'd like to draw a distinction between the personal right of the individual to wear the poppy versus the idea of making wearing the poppy a national obligation. As with any cause, the decision to wear it for many people is a deeply personal one. I would therefore never demand that someone else be forbidden from wearing it. What I want to argue strident against, however, is the notion that wearing the poppy is somehow a measure of your decency as a human being, illustrated by the covert pressure for public figures, from news readers to politicians to actors to wear it, combined with the massive advertising campaigns that we see every year, whenever Remembrance Sunday rolls around. Other campaigns, such as pink ribbons and breast cancer and for AIDS, do not have the same kind of publicity and are not enforced upon the public consciousness in the same way. The implication seems to be that you are not a true patriot unless you wear the poppy. As someone who does not wear one, this is a notion I resent quite a lot. My first reason for this is that I believe the original idea behind Remembrance Sunday is being eroded. The initial wearing of the red poppy in the 1920s, as I understand it, was meant to symbolise how Britain sent a generation of its young men off to die in droves, a deeply sad chapter in our history that occurred not once, but twice with the outbreak of World War II. Although the poppy is now supposed to serve as a tribute to all fallen soldiers, the context of the two world wars were arguably different from those that have been fought since, in particular within the last 13 years. This is because for one thing, the Second World War in many ways involved little choice back to fight against the rise of fascist forces. The same cannot be said, I would argue, of Iraq and Afghanistan, which were highly politicised wars that many would argue were fought for morally dubious reasons, with many people still debating whether they were essential to the national security of anyone involved. Remembrance Sunday encourages us to honour and lionise the people who have done tours in Baghdad or held in province. However, I am not someone who believes those wars should have been waged in the first place, and therefore feel I cannot in good conscience express admiration for the people who fought in them. It is also often ignored that for the most part, Although there were some who notably joined up willingly in the First World War, many of the men sent into battle in both World Wars were conscripted. This is linked to why there are war memorials in every city, town and village in this country, commemorating the people who perished in them. The people in both instances were ordinary men. They were teachers, postmen, shopkeepers. In every sense, they were our boys. Yet conscription no longer exists in Britain, and today's servicemen and women join them out of choice. In the case of the Second World War, Soldiers were also arguably fighting to directly defend their families, homes and livelihoods from a looming threat. It was not an option to fight. Any enemies we face today, both real and imagined, I would argue are hardly comparable. As much as the government and the heads of the army would like us to think otherwise, I refuse to believe my freedoms were at stake in Iraq and Afghanistan. My right to a vote every five years was not being administered from Kandahar, and I doubt that getting rid of my right to express my opinion was particularly high as damage to do this. I therefore believe it is wrong to associate today's wars, to the extent that we do, with the events of 1914 and 1939. The second point I would like to discuss is that although I would still feel considerable pity for those families that prematurely lose a loved one serving in the armed forces, that is not the same as a belief that the military, and any wars they are involved in, are always unquestionably good. I personally would never ask anyone to kill or die on my behalf, particularly as the decision to maintain an army is one made by the state on behalf of everyone else. <coughs> including those who would rather opt out. And while it is certainly true that it is politicians that make the wars, not soldiers, 
It is a condition of being in the army that you might be asked to kill and die. Something that service men and women knowingly consent to when they sign up. This is not a secret. Therefore, if I do not respect or support what has happened in the majority of conflicts Britain has been involved with, at the very least in the last 13 years, then I refute the notion that I am meant to pledge unconditional support for those who decide to join the military on every Remembrance Day, not to mention the rest of the year. I have no doubt there are dedicated service men and women that do very heroic things. Yet the army fundamentally exists as a tool of the government. The kinds of sentimental nationalism we see on display, particularly on Remembrance Day, try to get us to pretend that everything the military does is self-sacrificing, and aimed at helping people abroad who simply cannot help themselves, even if no humanitarian justification for conflict necessarily exists, and the army's activities are more about appeasing the self-serving wings of politicians and come at the expense of the stability and well-being of those other countries. It would be comforting to believe that the British Armed Forces are forever engaged in a pseudo Lord of the Rings style struggle of good versus evil, where every foreign enemy is on a par with the Third Reich. Yet the reality is that such a view is a cynical smokescreen. For politicians, such displays also serve as a convenient distraction from the problems of the American <coughs> borders, even more so in a time of recession and unpopular economic policies. Crucially, this also prevents us from asking why wars are fought at all. The danger inherent within this leads me on to the third point I would like to make. It is my belief that even when there are times when war might be necessary, by its very nature it is horrendous and traumatising for those involved. Examples of this abound, from the shattered homes of foreign civilians, to the missing limbs and post-traumatic stress disorder of returning soldiers. We should acknowledge that, come to terms with it, and not glory in it. Soldiers, like many other paid professionals, might do a job that is at times unpleasant and somewhat hardly necessary, and there are times when that should be acknowledged. While I have no problem with the funds from the poppy appeal being used to care for the wounded and the traumatised, I don't believe that where anyone should require us to believe that soldiers are heroes purely by default of position, which is why I believe the pressure for us to invite the military so unconditionally into our hearts and homes is dangerous. The fetishisation of our servicemen and women is also often unbalanced, with poppy day, in my experience, rarely paying tribute to the victims of UK aggression abroad, from Northern Ireland, to Iraq, to South Africa, or forcing us to ask, ask ourselves tough questions about whether we should be using past conflicts to vindicate and justify current ones. The violent and jingoistic overtone of the Remembrance Day is now so often saturated with the disturbing, and if they continue, we risk straying dangerously close to believing in the absolute value of war, that this is somehow morally strengthening and cleansing rather than violent and destructive and that carnage unleashed in the name of the state is somehow always more legitimate than any other form. The poppy was initially introduced as a kind of contemplative memento to the truly horrific nature of armed conflict, but increasingly it has been realigned into a symbol of aggressive nationalism. That is why I believe that this house should not wear the poppy, and the proposition must stand. Thank you. Mr Chairman, members of the House, today I'm going to base my speech around um, the tagline of the Poppy Appeal, which is to the memory of the fallen and to the future of the living. I want to talk about this because I think it sums up the concept of why we should all be proud if we choose to, to wear a poppy. Um, because it's important to remember those that have given their lives in past conflicts and in current conflicts. And it's important that we stand in solidarity with those that are injured and those of the relatives that have been injured or killed in combat. Um, but before I get on to that, I'd just like to engage in a little bit with, uh, for a battle with um, Ms. Fry. Um, so, first of all, this idea that anyone is ever forced to wear a poppy, it, it's nonsense. There, there, is, there is no one telling you that you must wear a poppy. Even if politicians are always on the news wearing poppies, if newscasters have to wear poppies, even if it's somehow expected of us that we should wear poppies, no one is actually telling you that you must wear a poppy. Any feeling when you choose to put money into your Royal British Collection box to buy one, that is your personal choice, if you identify with the cause. So this, 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 the idea that you're forced to wear one, it's simply nonsense. Um, she also says, talks about the, 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 that they were our boys in the First and Second World War. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but our boys are definitely worth commemorating. Um, 
Yeah, and she she also talks about um, jingoism and militarism um, and surrounding these um, remembrance events. And she uses the example of um, conflict tragedies in the likes of Northern Ireland. Um, so being from Northern Ireland, I'm going to discuss a little bit about Northern Ireland right now. If we're going to talk about militarism, there's a um, British state um, militarism having impacts on other countries. Um, there's probably no greater example than Ireland. Um, because they, they've been coping with it, or having to deal with the consequences of British military action up until now. Um, but even Ireland, even Ireland is now starting to have its own Remembrance Days, not on the 11th of November, but on different days to commemorate Irish volunteers who served in the British forces in both the First and Second World War and have served in conflict since that. If we're going to talk about how British military action has had effects on other countries, even other countries um, that have allied themselves to Britain in the past or have had no choice but to be allies to Britain in the past, even they are celebrating the deaths of soldiers um, that have died in these conflicts because they're justified. Um, so why is national remembrance important? Um, Regardless of what we think of present conflicts, including Afghanistan and Iraq, which Dr. Newsbacker is going to talk a little bit about, I want to bring it back, back to the original reason that we have the poppy. We're going to talk about the First World War, the sort of obscene conditions that these soldiers were thrown into. It's worth remembering. People younger than all of us, all of us being between the ages of around 18 to 20 usually, people our age and younger were thrown into trenches, thrown into absolutely horrific conditions, and forced to charge at enemy trenches, forced to deal with sorts of things that they'd never had to deal with before. They were seeing aircraft flying over their heads when many of them had never seen aircraft. They were having bombs dropped on them. They, they, things they just were not used to. Um, it's the sort of thing, it, it's completely obscene conditions um, that you're expecting these people to walk into and not walk out of unscathed. Britain has been in a condition of total war twice in its history, the First and Second World War. Um, people were brought up drafted and um, and like the, the idea that the tagline of like they've sacrificed their their today um, or sorry their tomorrow for our today regardless of what you think of these conflicts that's what happened these people these people built the modern state and the modern world that we live in and that that is worth taking one day out of your year to stop to pause to think about the sacrifice oh, that is our that our current state of affairs is built on yes Okay, so regardless of whether you think the first, second, the first World War was necessary, the Second World War, on the other hand, if there's ever been a just cause of fighting genocidal maniacs, that is one that is justified. Um, so if you're going to talk about why, why is it shaped the modern world, so the likes of um, some of the first notions of working closer together, um, the European Union came out of the Second World War, the kind of like Woodrow Wilson's points for self-determination came out of the first that like have created modern state borders. Whether those were later problematic and had to be amended is by the by, but we, we have to acknowledge that it did create the modern world that we're living in, or to help to create it. So the poppy is then important because it stands in solidarity um, with those service personnel and um, and did sacrifice their lives in those wars, and it stands in solidarity with their families, which is now what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, so when we talk about the future of the living, when we wear a poppy, the funds that we give um, go to the Royal British Legion, and this is some of the work that they do. They provide um, support for bereaved families, for those that have lost loved ones in conflict, um, they provide help for wounded soldiers, they provide help for younger veterans to go on to other types of employment outside the armed services, and perhaps most importantly, they provide care for older veterans that have lost their friends in wars, they've lost their families, um, or have just become just old, old and like just financially dependent on, on other people. Um, so when we wear a poppy, every year the poppy of Peel raises around forty million pounds. Um, that, that, that is a large amount of money, but the kind of work that it does is absolutely amazing. So it provides things like care homes, it provides um, programs like Battle Back, which <coughs> provide military recovery programs, it provides Bravo 22 uh, theatre company for helping with post-traumatic stress disorder, and these things are all incredibly relevant because considering that Help for Heroes estimates that out of the 200,000 personnel that we've sent to Afghanistan recently, about 75,000 of them will come back with either mental or physical um, disabilities. On that point? I mean, that, that, you're out of time. Um, the, the, 
it is worth remembering that those people are going to come back you know, harmed by those conflicts and so to stand in solidarity by wearing poppies and giving money to the Royal British Legion to help those people um, is important. Um, and regardless of whether you think that, oh, the government should be stepping in to do this, I mean, they're not. A recent Chavez report um, author, Professor Tim uh, Briggs, has said that soldiers, despite the military covenant, are still having to jump through hoops on the NHS to get priority, and many are still falling through the safety net and are not battling back to recovery. Shame. So when we talk, so the 40 million pounds that people donate this year will help alleviate the pain and suffering of soldiers who have been wounded in com combat, will help alleviate the suffering of their families who have been bereaved, and ultimately it reminds us to think and remember those that have died in past conflicts to build the modern world that we live in and enjoy. Thank you very much. is somehow disrespectful or is a sign of not supporting the soldiers or not having some sort of concern for, for the truth. I, I would argue um, really 180 degrees the opposite. Part of my problem with the current conflicts that are being pursued and have been pursued over the last 13 years by our government and the other Western governments is precisely that as well as killing huge numbers of innocent civilians in various different parts of the globe. They also lead to the unnecessary death of British service people in wars that are directed and controlled and organised by the politicians um, but are often illegal, um, normally don't have majority support in this country and are always futile. And therefore I'd say that, you know, the, 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 in a way, we're the people opposing these wars. On a point of information... Can I just finish my... Can I just finish my... my no. Uh, on a point of information... <laughs> when we... Uh, he, he, he can decide um, uh, the, um, the, the, the question then is not one of remembrance itself, it's of how wars are remembered, how wars are interpreted, how uh, the whole question of war in society is addressed. And my, um, uh, my real problem with the poppy, the way the poppy fits into this, is that I think there's a concerted effort by the establishment, by different sections of the establishment at the moment, to create the conditions wherein those wars can be uh, conducted more easily, to actually rewrite some of the history uh, of the uh, of previous wars, particularly the First World War. I'll let the point of information come in there. You're very kind. The, uh, is it not true that when we declared war on Germany in 1939, uh, we were conducting an illegal operation. Had, the, had we not declared war, had we not started the Second World War, we might still be living in a, a peaceful world. And illegal, when it's applied to wars, is not the same as illegal with respect to ordinary crimes amongst people. And labeling war illegal now, whereas war then is given a sort of rosy glow, is distorting the past even further, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I didn't mention the Second World War, but I mean, the question of illegality is not the main one. The main one is futility and destruction, it seems to me. But anyway, uh, the, I want to return to this idea that the, the government and the establishment are, are trying to create, are actually using remembrance here to try and create the conditions they can pursue their wars. First of all, £8 million pounds is being spent this year on commemorations, and that's the word they use, and Cam David Cameron talked about a uh, celebration of national spirit, of the national spirit and so forth. Uh, of the First World War. There is undoubtedly a concerted attempt to sort of revise the history of, first, of the First World War by academics, by journalists, mm -hmm. Max Hastings, no, I'm going to continue, Jeremy Paxman, um, Sir Hugh Strawn, Michael Gove, Maria Miller, actually David Cameron himself. And this I find really quite unpleasant. There's an attempt to portray the carnage of World War I, where about 19 million people uh, died. Uh, across the world as something that was justified in defence of uh, liberal democracy. Um, and I think the, the, the whole, the, the increasing 
kind of campaign around the populace is part of this general attempt to rehabilitate militarism. By the way, an attempt to rehabilitate militarism as a consequence of the disasters of Afghanistan and Iraq, I think even our rulers understand were, were terrible. That's why they're spending all this money uh, to do it in, in, in the first place. And I'm going to continue. Um, and, um, you know, the, the whole thing around the poppies uh, is, is, as I say, is, I think, um, uh, undeniably uh, part of that. And there is a huge amount of pressure. I mean, on the buses in London, I don't know about in Manchester, but there's a Joanna Lumley tape that plays every like, couple of minutes saying, get your poppies from, uh, you know, so and so. I mean, journalists are actually told by their employers that they have to wear uh, poppies on. The BBC sends them to their foreign correspondents around the world, and basically you have to wear them. And if you don't wear them, you get uh, a number of journalists have reported getting hate mail and getting serious bombing. Point of information, Mr. Speaker? Is it not true that the BBC raises money for many worthy causes through many appeals, and the poppy appeal is merely one of them, and raising money for disabled ex-service people on our <laughs> national network is surely a good use of, of, of uh, licensed payers' uh, time, licensed fee payers' time, and bears no worse a connotation than the many other worthy charities that the BBC gives their time to? I'm not, I'm not aware that they force all their presenters to uh, support any other cause. Perhaps they should, sir. I think you need to stop interrupting me now, actually. Um, okay, does this matter? Now, it seems to me that um, it is quite important, actually, because I think that the people, uh, the people sort of organising uh, at the top this campaign of, of, of remembrance, this campaign of rewriting of history and the poppy campaign, are actually the same people who are pushing for, and have been pushing over the last uh, number of years, for various foreign wars. Um, and they're still at it. David Cameron brought Parliament back last summer to try and um, start the bombing of Syria. He came back again to Parliament this year, as we know, and managed to push through uh, the third attack on Iraq for in the, for in, in, in the last 25 years, uh, the fourth foreign war that Britain, major foreign war that Britain has been involved in in 13 years. And I think these wars have caused absolute carnage uh, and mayhem in, in large parts of Central Asia and the Middle East. And if you look at the world now, it's an immeasurably more dangerous, more volatile place than it was back in 2001, with terrorism spreading um, on an arc from Central Asia through the Middle East into, in, into Africa. And this is the direct result of these wars. And so therefore, although clearly talking about the poppy and taking position on the poppy is not the main part of that campaign, the main thing is to, I believe, is for the anti-war movement to put clear arguments as to why the, the, the war shouldn't be pursued. Nevertheless, I think it, it's not just a question of argument. The, the government, the media, the establishment in general, they use, um, uh, they try and manipulate popular sentiment, um, they try and um, create a certain atmosphere in society, which is also another way of promoting, um, of promoting their policy. So I believe this, the, the, the promotion of the poppy is part of the sanitisation of war, a blurring of the, of, the, of the distinction between sympathy for the troops and support for foreign aggression and part of an attempt to kind of reassess and rewrite history and that's why I think it's important that people who value peace and progress actually don't wear the poppy and if possible wear the white one. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The role of the anti-war movement is to make rational arguments and not to discuss poppies. And I would agree with that sentiment, Mr. Speaker, and people here assembled. The role of the anti-war movement is to oppose war not to make it difficult to raise funds for disabled ex-service people, not to make it difficult to remember the horror and the futility of war that has gone before us. The first poppies were worn, first poppies after the First World War were bought at Wanamaker's department store in Philadelphia, and they were worn by Americans in 1919. The Americans did not retain the custom of wearing the poppy. The Americans forgot 
what war meant in the First World War. And I would suggest to you that the millions of dollars that are devoted, the millions of dollars that are devoted to making war look good on our television and film screens from America, against which eight million pounds spent on remembrance is a pittance. 18 million, it's still a pittance. It's the cost of one Hollywood blockbuster, one. And instead, and instead, the Americans let the custom fall by the wayside, whereas in the British Commonwealth, the poppy was taken up and retained in Britain, Canada, and Australia. And it meant that there was clear remembrance in 1937, 38, and 39 of what war would mean. A robust anti-war movement that ensured that we did not become involved in the Second World War until the last possible moment. What does war do? I am under no illusions. What have recent wars done? I am under no illusions. I have taken my own soldiers to war. I have seen my own students go off to war, and I have gone to their funerals. I know what happens in war, and I can tell you that if we did not have a means within our culture to force us once a year, only once a year, to remember horror at the thought of war, then the feeling that you get when you stand at a remembrance service with your poppy or without it, with your poppy or without it, when you stand at a remembrance service and reflect upon those who died, did they die for a good cause? My great-grandfather went to fight the First World War. He fought to keep Transylvania Hungarian. Didn't work either. <laughs> he fought for his emperor and didn't even live through the war. Who was a silly old bastard, Franz Josef, who gave his wife gonorrhea. <laughs> I am not here to tell you that war is anything more than a, continu uh, than a, a continuation of government policy, brutal way of doing business that countries feel sometimes they must resort to. I'm not here to glorify war, but I'm here to tell you that the dignified, gentle way that we in the British Commonwealth choose to remember those who went before. Go on. Soldiers are our real stars. I don't think that's dignified. I think it's crass and It is crass. When I pick up the sun and I see soldiers referred to as heroes by default, I'm appalled. But it is not the humble field poppy that makes that claim. It is Rupert Murdoch who makes that claim. It is the humble poppy. This is a Canadian one. In the Royal Canadian Legion. They're a little bit more durable than the British ones. I've got a British one on my coat. I made both donations. It is not the poppy that makes that play. What does the poppy say? It was a graduate of the University of Toronto, John McRae, who wrote Flanders Fields. And John McRae, an army doctor, inspired when he had to bury one of his comrades in the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. When John McRae, a graduate of the University of Toronto, or the Manchester of the West. On that point. Go on. Um, the copy's a plant, it's not sentient, I don't think it says anything. Oh, for goodness it sake. Symbols, madam. Symbols speak for us. I wear this poppy not because I'm interested in botany, madam. I wear this poppy. Poppy because it calls upon me to remember, it calls upon everyone to remember the millions who died, not just in the ridiculous, sanguine mess of the First World War, who died in the Second World War, which we pretend was to keep Hitler from invading Britain, something he was never going to do. Also a ridiculous war that could have been prevented, that should have been prevented. We were, I remember Paul Mervis. Officer Cadet, when I knew him, went off and died in Afghanistan as a captain in a war which I think was pointless. 
The war in Afghanistan, I think, has done us no good. And the nonsense that our ministers said about protecting the streets of Britain by fighting in Afghanistan, rub it! Rub it! And I remember Paul Mervis by, by wearing this poppy. I remember people who go off and die because governments make them. And this reminds me that, yes, when an anti-war group tells us that we must think before we fight. We must not go and fight a war just because our allies think it's a good idea. Just because we think that surgical bombing or some similar rubbish is going to give us what we need by way of a policy objective. This reminds us that we pay, not boys and girls, that our young men and women pay for that with their lives. Is that my time up? I beg you to oppose tonight. Your point is very well taken, sir. Um, and uh, once upon a time, uh, a, uh, a relative gave me and, uh, and my ex um, uh, live strong wristbands, yellow wristbands, and they had to do with Lance Armstrong and his, his getting over cancer and things like that. And I said, what, what, what do they say? And, and the, the relative was unable to tell me. Similarly, what does a pink breast cancer ribbon say? Somebody tried to, 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 to get my mother to give a donation for one. Uh, at the time, she was dying of pancreatic cancer. And they said, Can you, would, would you take one of these? It's for cancer. And she said, no thanks, I've already got cancer. <laughs> the idea that a ribbon and a dis what does a ribbon say about cancer? Does it say, I gave money? Yes, I suppose it does. Does it say, I think cancer is bad? Wow! <laughs> now that's a tough statement, that's a bold statement to make. So you're right. When we take a simple symbol, we have to take with it all of, the, all of the baggage that comes with it, and we have to be prepared to make a reasonable statement. The semiotics have got to be rich, they've got to be meaningful, and we must beware. We must beware of saying too much with our symbols. What does the poppy say? Ophelia says in Hamlet, she says, there's rosemary, that's for remembrance. And when we take a, a simple flower and wear it for Remembrance Sunday, Remembrance Day we call it in Canada, it's on, always on the 11th, not on a Sunday, because we don't have quite as much Christian baggage in Canada. <laughs> on Remembrance Day we wear a poppy for remembrance, and that's what it means. And what does it mean to me when I know that, that the BBC will not let you go in front of a camera uh, before the 11th of November without a poppy on, they will forcibly stick it on you. You're absolutely right, absolutely brutal about it, and you're lucky if you're wearing your white poppy, if they don't pin it right on top of your white poppy. What does that say to me? That says to me that the BBC needs sorting out. The BBC Trust needs to think hard about how they make their statements, because yes, it is a worthy charity, but forcing people to make a statement is ridiculous. But what do I say when I wear this? What does anybody say? Remembrance. Remember. That's what it means. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I think George Newsbanger has pretty much covered why the, the symbol of the poppy is rather important. It, it does symbolize um, standing in solidarity with injured service personnel um, and standing in solidarity with their families and actually remembering um, about the human sacrifice that takes place within war. Um, in terms of what was directed at me of whether or not we're forced um, to wear the poppy, I, I'm very happy to go away and read that book. I haven't read it, um, so I can't argue the um, dynamics effectively. But I would say that, that there are people in this room that are not wearing poppies. There are people in this room that are wearing poppies. There are people in this room who will wear poppies, and people in this room who will not go and wear poppies. All of those positions are equally fine. No one, no one ever tells you, people may, may say that you should wear poppies, but no one, except maybe the BBC, and I don't necessarily agree with that either, um, force you to wear a poppy. And I think that is the point, that it is a willing remembrance of people that have 
died, have been injured in war. And maybe the reason that the poppy has become so widespread is that you have to remember that when they became popular after the First and Second World War, there wasn't a single family or a community or village that was left untouched by those wars. That every single family was affected by those wars. And that's why they wore poppies in remembrance of their loved ones and other members of their community that died in those wars. And I think the same can still stand today that nearly everyone will have maybe personal reasons for wearing a poppy, that they probably know someone who's been in the armed forces or has or has been injured in some kind of conflict. Um, and for those personal reasons, they probably still want to wear the poppy. But other people who may not have those reasons may still feel that they want to wear those, the poppy to remember those that have given their lives in past conflicts. Thank you. Here, here. Um, I agree with you. Um, I mean, the fact that when Jon Snow basically said that he wasn't going to wear one, that that became a national issue or that became a story, I think speaks volumes about how we view the poppy and the fact that for, at the very least, for journalists, it is an obligation. If, um, and also, I mean, I was in a debate this morning about it, and the abuse you get just for saying you don't want to wear one when we live in a democracy, for example. Um, and this clearly, yes, okay, there may not be somebody pinning one on my chest when I walk down the street, but the covert pressure to wear one is still enormous, more than any other campaign. And that I certainly agree that I think we do let symbols speak for a bit too much. They can be very helpful, certainly. Um, but the trouble is, is that the meanings of symbols, I think, can change over time, and they can be co-opted, and they can be co-opted and hijacked by people with not always the best intentions, and I do believe that's what's happening with the Red Poppy. Chris? Yeah, and I think when you want to, if you want to try and disentangle the, the impact of a symbol, you have to look at who's promoting it and how it's being promoted, and here you do have a situation where all the top politicians, all the civil servants, all the people in the military, the MOD, and right across the media, um, without exception, they are really, you know, putting uh, putting this stuff out there. On, I mean, with with the kind of intensity that I can, I, I can't think, you know, what else matches it. And you have to say, why are they doing that? Why are they spending this money? Why? What's this all about? And it seems, I mean, this isn't, by the way, something that's always happened. I mean, there's always been Remembrance Day, but the, this sort of level of intensity around the, 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 the kind of public uh, promotion of the poppy and the attendant kind of um, rigmarole is, is something relatively new. Uh, and, and, and I think you've got to be, you know, I mean, Lynette seems to agree with us on almost everything. Um, and, and, he's, and he's right and he's sceptical about the media and about the wars and all these things, but somehow suspends her scepticism when it comes to the, the, this one question of the poppy. It seems to me you have to see this in a wider context, and this is about uh, a, a serious attempt, a conscious attempt, to, um, to, to, to make wars fightable. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, neither of us have ever made the claim that um, having the poppy stops wars indefinitely. We've argued that it makes us pause and evaluate about what a war entails, that it entails human sacrifice, and we have to think and remember those human sacrifices. But no, neither of us have said that having the poppy stops wars indefinitely. And I also think the idea that, I mean, this is a personal opinion, but I also would stand by that there are times where war is a justifiable thing to do and that the, the idea that poppies somehow justify these wars I, I, think, I think is nonsense in that every single remembrance parade that you'll go to, every single remembrance service you'll go to, you'll hear First World War poetry talk about the abysmal human conditions that the soldiers had to live in. At no other point in the year is anti-war sentiment like rammed on your throat more than Remembrance Sunday, when they talk about how horrific these conditions were. And so, like, the, the, the words of Wilfred Owen are always read out at some point, you know, don't tell them the old lie, dulce et decorum est et pro patria mori. Do not tell them the old lie that it is sweet and right to die for your own country. These, these are the sort of words that are read out at every single Remembrance service across the UK and across the Commonwealth. They're not glorifying war, they're talking about the human sacrifice that went on in these wars, and it's those human sacrifices that the poppy remembers. It doesn't stop wars, but it remembers the sacrifice that people have to take within those wars. Yeah.
I have a hard time speaking sitting down because I'm a teacher by profession, but I'll give it a go. Um, poppies don't prevent wars. Absolutely right. Nothing, I would suggest, really does a good job of preventing wars. You're, you're, you're spot on there. But the experience of the First World War and the experience, indeed, of the Second World War <laughs> resulted in, among people of goodwill, things like, uh, well, Mike Pearson, a Canadian, like John McRae, Mike Pearson was, uh, he experienced the First World War, he was a war correspondent in the Second World War, he became Prime Minister of Canada after he was the uh, Foreign Minister of Canada. He pretty much single-handedly invented United Nations peacekeeping. And that was based upon his goodwill uh, and his experience of war and what it meant. So, will we prevent wars by remembering the reality of war, by forcing ourselves out of the Hollywood version of war, by forcing ourselves in solemn services, which I would not call rigmarole, in solemn services where we think in silence upon those who gave their tomorrow for our today, however misguided the campaign may have been, that doesn't stop war. But I would suggest that not remembering, but not doing all of those things, will make it more likely that we fight war. And it is therefore incumbent upon us, whether or not we choose, to show a symbol of remembrance, and some people are capable of mourning without the symbol of mourning. Some people do not need to wear black to a funeral in order to mourn, I can understand that. But if we don't remember, if all that we have left is the narrative of heroism, then we'll lack something. And is there something noble about dying for your country, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Indeed, at Sandhurst in the chapel, you can see where it's still, from the First World War, painted up on the wall, although the chapel no longer faces in that direction. I'll quote somebody <coughs> whose values we all share, who once said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one, remember. And who was that? Mr. Spock. <laughs> Mr. Spock, whose values we all share, <laughs> made the point that the needs of the many must sometimes take precedence. So I do not dismiss the idea that there is something in giving your all for other people, to help other people, that there is room for heroism when appropriately applied. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a false polarisation to say, on the one hand, you know, it's, it's about remembering or not remembering. I'm very much for not just remembering, but understanding the past and understanding uh, history, and that's, that's what's important. It seems to me that the current sort of um, media stroke government kind of campaign is, 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 is actually militates against understanding and against a real, um, a, a real engagement with what happened and a serious debate about whether it should have happened. And I'll give you some examples. I mean, by the way, it's, when I see someone wearing a red poppy, it's not that I immediately think that, you know, oh, there's someone who's pro-war. I don't think that at all. I think people do wear it for all sorts of different reasons and probably mainly for reasons of, you know, total respect and so forth. It's, it's a, it's a question of how that image is being manipulated, and I think it is being manipulated. I'll give you, as I say, a couple of examples. I mean, never again is not a phrase that you will see in any of the official celebrations. In fact, it's, it's it, there's two words that they would absolutely rule out of being, um, because it's not, or clearly it's not what they believe. They want to do it again, um, and they keep doing it again. So um, that, that, that is not a, a, word, a phrase you'll be hearing, nor will you be hearing Wilfred Owen's poetry. In fact, Maria Miller, 
the ex-culture secretary, who was very involved in the setting up of the commemorations for World War I, mounted a big personal campaign against the poets and the playwrights, who she implied were oversensitive to suffering and therefore unable to give a real, um, a real evaluation of the war. Um, and finally, I mean, the, the clearest um, point, and the one that I think unambiguously proves that the, unfortunately, the British Legion, whatever else, whatever their values may be, whatever their virtues may be, is conducting a propaganda campaign. They have asked Joss Stone, Joss Stone to sing a song on Remembrance Day, which is going to be a big single. Um, and it is the Green Fields of France, um, which is a famous anti-war song. You probably know it. It's an anti-war song by a guy called Eric Vogel. They have omitted the final um, verse of the song because the, uh, the final verse is entirely about the futility of war. So, I mean, that is, um, which there's a big campaign about, and tens of thousands of people uh, 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 have signed the petition about it. So, you know, I mean, that's not an accident. There is an attempt to um, manipulate the situation, to, to present a particular, and basically a, a favorable view of war here. There's no question about it. And, and the question is, you know, are we going to oppose that? Are we going to try and stand up against that? What is a kind of a, a propaganda operation? Whatever else it may be, it has a strong element of propaganda. And I think, I think you know, if we're serious about the issues, then I think we have to. Okay. Um, yeah, the latest point I seem to remember was um, you were saying, Poppies don't actually encourage us to remember. It's more about encouraging this idea that actually conflict is noble. Um, as a, as a um, I think this is true to add to Chris's point. Things like the military wives choir and the poppy girls and things like that. I mean, I'm sure they're very well intentioned, but it's just. I think the thing I object to is there's never one. There's never any mention of the people that die at the hands of British soldiers. And two, we're encouraged to love soldiers as though they're our own family members, but we're never sort of really told why. And there's never any questioning. It never comes with any question of why they're fighting and why until very recently they were fighting for so long. And I think this is why there is an agenda behind the poppy campaign of just love the military, full stop. But don't ask what they're doing, why they're doing, should they be doing it, why do we have a military? And those, those are tough questions we need to ask ourselves. And I don't think the poppy is helping us reflect on that at all. I mean, I've never, from either Chris or I said that it's bad that the money for the poppy goes towards helping wounded servicemen or anything like that, but I would pick up on something you said about how a woman whose husband has died feeling like her husband hadn't died in vain. Well, maybe we should be asking the question, maybe he did. I mean, that is my objection. I think it's, yes, okay, that a lot of the horrendous stuff we've talked about would still be the case if poppies weren't there, but I still don't think it's, it deflects from the point that poppies shouldn't really be hijacked for that cause. It's, and Ultimately, I mean, and I think I've also said that no one should wear them. Fundamentally, as I said in my speech, it comes down to something very personal. People might do it because they have family members in the military or something like that. But it is this pressure for everybody to wear it that's it's quite it's quite overbearing. And yes, there may be some good coming from it, but it's there is there is also an insidious undercurrent which I think does need to be challenged, regardless of whatever good comes from wearing the Yes. No, I mean, I, this is, you know, it's a, serious, it's a serious point you raise, obviously. But, I mean, my, uh, my feeling is that, um, in the end of the day, it's, uh, we want there to be um, a serious remembrance. Um, the question is, is it going to be a remembrance that um, allows us to, uh, to deal with history in a way that we end up not repeating it? That's the problem. Um, and um, my simple answer to you, in a way, would be to say, where the white poppy? Because what the white poppy does is it says, you know, I am concerned about the deaths. I'm concerned about the deaths of the military. I'm concerned about the deaths of, um, of, of you know, the, the, the countries that we've attacked as well. But that I want to have an impact on, uh, on, on the debate in society, or I want to generate more of a debate in society. Because I think the, it's a kind of... In my view, it's a sort of it's a clever trick that's being played because you're right. The propaganda machine will still be there, but the great thing from their point of view, the poppies, they're kind of they can sort of turn around and say, "Look, everyone supports us. 
you know, that's the trick they're playing. It's like when, in fact, I mean, people like you and probably most other people who wear the poppy are not saying we, we support war. But you, you can be portrayed, it can be portrayed in, a certain, in, the, in the sense that you are. And so there's a sort of manipulation going on, in my opinion, the way the symbol kind of works in society. And that's the, that's the, the kind of, um, the, the sort of current thought that I would like, to, I would like to, 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 to break down. So therefore, I'd say wear the white poppy, give money to the British Legion. You don't have to have a poppy, just give them money if you want to. Um, you know, it's not true that the, the poppy raises money, it's people giving money and, and, and actually I believe, by the way, the government should, should look after people who they send into stupid foreign wars and get wounded. I think this is something that the government should pay for, I don't think it should be done, you know, but anyway, that's another question. But, you know, I think it's just, it's, that, that, that's, the, that's the thing here, we need to, we need to try and create a situation where, where this doesn't happen again. Um, and, and rather than being the sort of unwitting carriers of a certain narrative that, that, that at least partly benefits the people who want to make it happen again. I've got to say, having been at various times in my career right at the centre of UK government as an outsider, and having been very close to people like uh, General John Kisley, who is the, uh, the national president of the Royal British Legion, uh, having been in the cabinet office and the Ministry of Defense, I have seen no evidence whatsoever of a desire to gain propaganda value from remembrance. And I say this not because I don't think it can happen, I say this because, for instance, for the 60th anniversary of D-Day, it was government policy that we were not going to commemorate it at all. And this was 2004, when our war effort in Iraq was flagging. And if there is any time when the Blair government could have been trusted to ruthlessly use anything to prop up public opinion, that would be it. They didn't want to do it. <coughs> and I think about social pressure. <coughs> social pressure under comparable circumstances. And I think about the white feather. The white feather of cowardice. In 1914, before conscription, the politically energized young women of London and Manchester would go out with boxes of white feathers and when they saw a young man of military age who was not in uniform, they would present him with the white feather of cowardice in front of God and everyone as part of an effort to humiliate them into joining up and going off to fight a war which they could very well have not been especially interested up to that point. That, that is a symbol being used to exercise social pressure. And when I compare that in my mind with the, the, the kids I see out, or the, the elderly veterans I see out selling poppies and raising money, I don't see the sinister. And when I hear the idea that one should wear a white poppy, because with a white poppy, you remember the people who've been killed, I don't see the distinction. Because the poppy is red, because that's the color of those humble flowers that grew on Flanders' fields. The blood red of the poppy stands precisely for the lives that were plowed under those fields. The red poppy is red because poppies are red, not because there is some political statement about uh, forgetting the cost of war. On the contrary, and in those solemn remembrance services that we finally did see in 2004, for D-Day, and that we will see this weekend and the following weekend because all of the services don't fit in at the Cenotaph. 
we are going to see people standing in silence and remembering those who were killed, and not just Tommy Atkins, the British soldier who was killed, but my great-granddad's cousin who was shot off at his horse at the Battle of who the hell knows, <laughs> fighting against, God help us, the Romanians. We'll remember all of them, because that's what remembrance is about. Oh, um, so, unfortunately, I haven't been in the heart of government yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so I, I, can't, I can't say with any defining... But I, I, I'll, I'll take Dr. Newsbacker's word for it that there probably isn't any sort of like you know, magic trick going on here that they're promoting militarism. Um, I, I think what we have to see is that I am I'm an officer cadet at, with the university's officers training corps, and I've previous to that I've been in the army cadet force as well. Um, but one of the things that you're taught about the military and about um, army life is that when you're fighting, you're not fighting for king and country, you're not fighting for God and Ulster where I'm but from, you're not fighting for these sorts of like concepts, you're fighting for the guy beside you, that you're fighting, you're fighting with him, that you're covering his back and he's covering yours. So the reason that, the reason that um, soldiers are out there collecting money for poppies is not because they want you to get behind them because they want you to support them going off to Afghanistan or Iraq. The reason they're out there collecting is because they see it as part of their job to stand with their comrades that have been injured or killed in war, and the Royal British Legion supports those people. And that's what they see that they are doing. They don't see it as promoting militarism or promoting the army. They see it as standing in solidarity with the troops that have been injured. Um, so. So the, the idea that um, Chris has put towards us of, so what are they up to? What are the MOD up to? I think what the MOD are up to are supporting soldiers. And regardless of whether you think that the government should um, plow more resources into um, military funding, their, their answer of, yes, oh, yes, they should. They should give more money to like funding, um, funding the NHS so that we can fund soldiers to better treatment. It's a bit of a cop-out answer to say that because the reality of the situation is they're not. And so that funding gap has to be plugged by charities. And the way that, that is done is by, wearing, is by um, donating money to the Royal British Legion and buying a poppy. And so when, when we're encouraged to buy the white poppy, what we have to remember is that the white poppy's funds don't go to soldiers. They don't go to bereaved families, they don't go to injured soldiers, they go into the Peace Pledge Union's administration funds to keep creating white poppies so they can put their educational resources across. That's not helping uh, wounded soldiers, that's not helping bereaved families, that's not helping elderly veterans. If you really want to stand in solidarity with them, you don't wear a white poppy, you donate to the Royal British Legion and you wear a red poppy. Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to weave in quite a lot of rebuttal about various misconceptions I think that have been picked up by the opposition about what we've said, but um, there's no time for that. So I'll just say briefly, yeah, neither have I said that anyone's patrolling the streets forcing us to wear a poppy, but it, both the question of the covert pressure to wear one and also the fact that the poppy is not making us ask serious questions about why soldiers are fighting, it's still there. The opposition have talked a lot about the poppy, uh, poppy supports servicemen and women who are injured. Neither of us have said that's a problem, that's fine. But the problem we both have is what the poppy is being used for alongside that. And today the proposition has talked about how the original sentiment behind Remembrance Day has been eroded. By the way, that's something that was meant to be a symbol of the horrendous nature of war, never again, lest we forget, is being used now to justify arrogant jingoism. And I have no objection to remembering the ordinary men who perished in the First and Second World Wars. Even and women. And women. <laughs> and would like to be able to wear the poppy proudly. But too often I feel it is used to venerate and unquestioningly lionise today's citizens and women without posing difficult questions about why they are fighting and whether the conflicts in which they are fighting are justifiable, and that is something the opposition has not really addressed. And we have talked about how the two world wars involve a prescription for the soldiers involved, whereas today's servicemen and women into the military have a choice, a decision that we are under no obligation to blindly respect if the war's soldiers are deployed in and not considered right or just. 
and we have discussed how the Second World War was about the direct defence of homes and livelihoods, and was therefore a hard conflict to avoid, that's been broadly agreed on in this debate, but the same cannot be said of more recent ones, any of them were morally suspect in their origins, and have also resulted in what many now feel was a pointless amount of bloodshed and destruction. And we have further more discussed how the copy is used as a means of encouraging us to love the armed forces unconditionally, without any detail about what exactly we should be grateful for, and very little mention of the people who have died at the hands of British aggression now and in previous conflicts. And if this continues, the original point of remembrance day has been permanently forgotten, and that is why this house can, continues to not like the copy. Thank you. Members of the House, um, I'm going to answer this point about um, why are soldiers worth remembering. Um, so yes, it is true that today there is no longer conscription, that people voluntarily sign up uh, to be part of the armed forces. But unlike Matty Fry or Chris Nynan, when they're sent to war, when they're given their deployment orders, they don't get to choose what conflict they go to. They don't get to choose whether they go to Iraq or Afghanistan. They don't get to choose whether that's right or wrong. They have their deployment orders and they have to go. So what we are celebrating and why we should stand in solidarity with those people is because those people are prepared to voluntarily put their lives on the line for our nation's foreign policy and military policy. And that is worth celebrating and commemorating and remembering. Um, so I've already explained to you in that last question that when the military, when, when, when the military are um, collecting money, it's not that they're trying to encourage people to be jingoistic or support militarism. They see it as an extension of their duty to help their, follow, their, their comrades, to help um, bereaved families. They see it as part of that. They see it as being part of the military family that they are a part of. That's, that's how they see it. They don't see it as pressing agenda. And as Dr. Newsbacker has already said, during, during the 60th anniversary of D-Day, the British government chose not to celebrate it because they didn't want to like, put the historical context and the sacrifice of the people that have landed at D-Day against the anti-war feeling of the Iraq War. Um, so I've explained to you in my speech that the work that the Royal British Legion does, it provides care homes, provides help for bereaved families, provides phy um, physical training for those who have, been, have had their limbs blown off by roadside bombs. That's the kind of thing that you're supporting by buying a poppy. Those, those are the kind of projects that you're supporting. And if you're going to talk about standing in solidarity, then, you, then it is right to wear a poppy. Thank you. They were concerned would constrain our ability to conduct further foreign wars. Now you know that's 2012. It's now 2014. I think I think I think they can. I think you can see a direct. And this is why we discussed actually in government so because it was in some of the newspapers as well. And I think you know what we're seeing here is the outcome of that concern, which was the result of the campaign against the Iraq War and the disaster of the Iraq War in Afghanistan. And the Afghan war, and I think, I think we have to see the whole furore around uh, World War One and the poppy as part of that. The, the question, really, uh, the, the bottom line question here, it's not the sort of passive thing about who wears what and and so on. And as I say, none of us are saying that I'd criticise anyone for wearing a red poppy. But there is a sort of more active question, which is whether people in society 
want to spend some of their time campaigning against what I believe has been an absolute catastrophe in terms of British foreign policy in the last 13 years. And one element, just one tiny element of that campaign is saying no to this particular operation, I think, and actually standing up and saying, you know, I'm not criticising people who wear the red poppy, but I want to either not wear one or wear the white poppy uh, to, to, to say something different, to say that something's gone very, very wrong under Tony Blair, under Gordon Brown, under David Cameron, uh, that, that what's been done in the Middle East, in Afghanistan uh, and elsewhere has been disastrous. And I think the more people that actually say, we're not going to allow this to happen, the better. And I think this debate needs to be seen in that context. the poppies blow between the crosses row on the row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn <coughs> saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in Flanders fields Thus far, I've never had trouble, apart from being touched by the horror of what McCrae described, based on only the first year of that horrible war. But he goes on. Take up our quarrel with the foe to you. From failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith, with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. That I have problems with. And I've thought about it a great deal. Take up our quarrel with the foe. That's, of course, my great granddad is talking about. Take up our keep on fighting, is what he's saying. I have a huge problem with that. Because had either side decided to walk away in 1915, perhaps a great deal of that bloodshed could have been prevented. And I'll tell you what my answer is. It's not for me to criticize that army doctor who was also killed in the war, or his comrades, what they thought, the kind of propaganda they'd absorbed that led them to volunteer. There were no conscripts in 1915 in the British Army or the British Empire's armies. It's not about us. It's not about what we think. It's about them. And it's important for us to remember them. And therefore, I beg you to walk out that door when this debate is over. And there's a little poppy stand there. If you haven't got one, get yourself a